Easter, he is risen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's great to see so many friendly faces and people we haven't seen in a while and some new people. If you're new or visiting with us today, we do want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. If you have any questions about St. Paul's, about today's service, or anything going on here in our community, uh, Pastor Ryan and myself would be very happy to uh, talk to you afterwards and meet with you throughout the week and answer any questions you might have. So, and thank you so much to all of you for joining us on live stream as well, especially my little guy Carson who couldn't be here today. <laughs> Uh, if you would, everyone on your way in should have grabbed uh, some message notes and announcements and a connection card if you wouldn't mind pulling them out at this time, that'd be great. Today, Pastor Ryan will be preaching a message called Realizing He's Risen. It's going to be in the book of John and the book of Luke. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we have some Bibles on the front table. And if you don't have one in, uh, at home as well, you're more than welcome to keep that one. We also have some soft, uh, soft covers for you downstairs as well if you prefer one of them. But don't leave here today. If you'd like a Bible, if you don't have one, please uh, feel free to grab one for yourself. On the back is our announcements for the week. Uh, just a few. We'll go through them quickly. Uh, this Wednesday, April 20th, if you like the music here and you uh, want to continue in that mode throughout the week, uh, this Wednesday we're having a Wednesday night worship uh, night. So it's downstairs in our cafe. It's a little bit more intimate, uh, a little bit more quieter music, and uh, it's just a time, great time to reflect and pray and uh, come uh, worship with some great music. So be encouraged to do that this Wednesday, 7.30 to 8.30, uh, downstairs in the cafe. And if you're a college student, we tell you all the time, feel free to bring your books and study. And just a great place to uh, just kind of renew yourself for the week, and especially after a, a big week like this with Easter um, Sunday. 
Uh, also, this uh, spring, starting very soon, we're going to be starting some uh, small groups here at St. Paul's. Uh, we have some going, but we're going to be starting some new ones. Uh, if, if you don't know what a small group is, it's basically just that, a small group of people who meet together uh, either weekly, bi-weekly, sometimes once a month, uh, depending on schedules, things like that. And it's just a um, time where people come and encourage one another, pray with one another, uh, talk about the Bible together, maybe uh, to talk about Sunday's passages and uh, sermons and discuss them. Um, so it's kind of, we give a lot of freedom to the groups. But um, if you're someone who wants to get into community and want to meet some more people here at St. Paul's, highly encourage you to join a small group. You can uh, email Pastor Ryan. His email is right on here. He'll get you connected in a, a group that, uh, that, that will work for you. And um, hope you can uh, join us for that. And then our final announcement is uh, monthly. We have a youth group here at St. Paul's. It's starting to grow. Uh, a lot of the students who go aren't, don't belong here on Sunday mornings, but they belong here, but they, they just don't come on Sunday mornings. But it's, a, it's an expanding group. If you know someone who would like to join us uh, for that, the next group will be May 11th. 7.15 to 8.15, uh, Pastor Ryan and uh, Steve Crosby have been teaching them the Apostles' Creed. And from what I hear, it's just been, they've had some great questions and uh, just been a great experience for the youth. So anyone from 8th grade to uh, senior in high school, uh, be encouraged to, to join that. And let uh, anyone in your life who might want to join that, let them know about it. Now, if you would, pull out your connection cards. Every week, we ask everyone to fill out one of these cards. Just a great way to let us know you were here worshiping with us this morning. There's a place uh, that you could check off what you're interested in here in St. Paul. So there's a place for small groups, getting baptized, serving somewhere. Feel free to check that off. We go through these weekly, and we'll email you back right away if you have any questions. Um, and then on the back, we have a place for uh, your prayer requests and praises. Uh, we have a prayer team who comes and meets over these cards each and every week and prays for the, the prayer requests on these cards. So we'd love to be praying for you. We'd love to be involved in your life. And uh, if there's also a spot if you just want the pastor to know, you could check that off as well. So, and then uh, if you want to be contacted about your prayer requests, you could check that off. So later in service, when we have um, communion, you could put these in the communion basket, um, in the offering basket. There's also one on the way out uh, on the back table. As you're leaving, you can throw them in there as well, and we'll get them. So uh, please fill, fill one of these out. Now, if you would, uh, would you please rise for today's invocation prayer and then uh, remain standing for, for continued worship. Dear Lord, may we realize afresh today what your death and resurrection mean for us. Forgiveness, freedom, and the ability to walk with you through this fallen world into eternity. May we always find satisfaction in you and your willingness to offer yourself to us. And Father, we just give you so much thanks for this place this morning, Lord. Thank you for, uh, for your Holy Spirit who's filled this place, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for us at the cross. Lord, we love you. We give you thanks. Let today's music and worship be praiseworthy to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. Great high priest whose name is love Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in heaven he stands No tongue can bid me thence Depart, no tongue can bid me thence. Depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied To look on him and pardon Behold 
him there the risen lamb my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable i am the king of glory of grace one with himself i cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with christ on high with christ my savior and my god with christ my savior and my god one with himself i cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with christ on high with christ my savior and my god with christ my savior and my god
Please be seated. Thank you, worship team. I love that song. Happy Easter. He, he is risen. Amen. So this week, some of you got a text from me, and I asked you to complete this sentence. Jesus re- Jesus' resurrection means that I... Dot, dot, dot. Um, so I'm going to share the responses that I received. Um, I'm keeping them anonymous because I didn't get permission from everybody to attach names to, uh, to the quotes. So if you wanted credit, I apologize that your name's not there. Hopefully you don't mind. Jesus' resurrection means that I have assurance of eternal life. It means that I can have real peace. It means that I will not remain dead but will be raised back to life with him. It means I have been forgiven of my sins and that I am to follow Jesus and his teachings for the rest of my life here on earth. It means that I have living hope resulting in peace and joy. I have nothing to fear because my Savior conquered death. It means that I am no longer enslaved to the dominion of the current world order of sin, death, and the devil, but am free to participate in the very life of God now and forevermore. It means that I will be ultimately okay, and so in reality, I have nothing to fear ever again. The resurrection empowers me to live a life where I don't have to win, where I don't have to keep track of wrongs, where I know that I am okay, and so can extend grace to others without worrying about the cost. So, beautiful responses there. Uh, I thank you all for doing my job for me this week. (laughs) Uh, If you wanted to be asked, and you weren't, I'm sorry. I really wanted to ask more people than I did, but, you know, the week goes by fast, especially Holy Week. But I think those seven answers are a really good summary of what Jesus' resurrection should mean to us, right? Freedom from the fear of death, peace, joy, and from those things, the power to live well. Right? The power to live righteously, to live mercifully, and to live courageously. The resurrection is the core of our faith. The Apostle Paul wrote that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Futile. You know, like moving a huge pile of sand with a thimble from one side of the room to the other and then just doing it again and putting it right back where you started. That's futility, right? And Paul is saying, if Christ is not raised, this whole Christianity thing is that. It's pointless. Now, every Easter, I struggle with this question. Um, Easter is always the hardest sermon of the year to prepare. I, like, sit there in indecision for hours Because I'm always wrestling with the question, how much time should I spend trying to defend the idea that the resurrection happened? In other words, how much time should I spend trying to offer reasons to believe as opposed to just assuming that we all believe and, you know, getting on with it? (laughs) Applying the resurrection to our lives. And I always feel stuck. 
Because it's hard to do both satisfactorily in one sermon. And some years I have decided to focus a lot on trying to defend the resurrection as a historical event. And I certainly do not claim to be able to prove the resurrection beyond any shadow of a doubt. I cannot do that. But I do think the the resurrection withstands scrutiny a lot better than skeptics tend to think. If you are open to the possibility that a miracle can occur, which is something that you are open to if you believe there's a chance that God exists, because God would be more powerful than the natural order, then if you look at the evidence, then you can see that the resurrection is more plausible than you might have initially thought when you just hear the idea that a guy rose from the dead. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. So just real quickly, I want to raise a a couple points. If you have ever heard me speak on Easter before, chances are you have heard me use this line. If you were making up a story, this isn't the kind of story that you would make up. Does this sound familiar to anybody here? Okay. That is true for many reasons. For example, the first witnesses to the resurrection in the Gospels are women. And in those days, women were not considered valid witnesses. So if you were making up a story, fabricating propaganda, that would be a very odd decision. Also, in the accounts, some of the disciples go to the tomb and they find it empty, but they don't see the risen Jesus there. They don't see the risen Jesus until that evening when he appears to them when they're in a locked room. If I was making up the story, I wouldn't do that. I would just have them go to the tomb and see the risen Jesus, right? Like Mary Magdalene did. Why would you do that if you're fabricating a story? Those are just a couple examples, but there's a whole bunch of reasons why, if if you look at the resurrection accounts carefully, they have what I would call the aura of authenticity. They don't sound like something that's been fabricated just as propaganda. They sound like the actual attempt to describe something that happened. If you're really skeptical about the resurrection, let me offer one more more point for you to consider this morning. A, A little chain of reasoning here. I think we can be very confident, whether, you know, somebody is a believer or not, that the tomb that Jesus was laid in was empty on Easter morning. And, uh, here's why I say that. Matthew's gospel says that at the time his gospel was written, a rumor was still circulating that had been circulating for years that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body. And if you want to look that up, it's Matthew 28, 15. Now, let's think about this. If Matthew says a rumor was circulating that the disciples had stolen the body, that must be true. Not that the rumor is true, but that a rumor was circulating. Right? Because Matthew would have no reason to tell us that unless it were true. That would be like me writing a letter to the church and saying, there's this rumor going around that I stole all the church's outreach money. Why would I ever say that unless the rumor was actually going around? Right? Otherwise, I'm just planting a seed in people's minds that's disturbing, which I guess I just did, but... <laughs> There would be no reason to say that, right? A rumor like that would only be necessary if the tomb was empty, right? So we can be confident this rumor was being spread, and there would be no reason for the rumor unless there was an empty tomb and people were looking for some way to explain it, right? Now, you might say, well, maybe that rumor was the truth. Maybe the disciples really did steal the body. That's exactly what happened. But the problem with that theory is that the the disciples did not have a good motivation to steal Jesus' body. The, The disciples did not gain fame or fortune by proclaiming that Jesus is risen. In fact, they suffered terrible persecution. And they would have known 
that stealing Jesus' body and telling everyone that he had risen would res result in terrible persecution because they just saw Jesus get crucified, right? They knew that the powers that be did not want this Jesus movement to continue. It would, be, it would have been completely against their interests to try and stage this thing. So we have every reason to believe that Jesus' tomb was empty, but no one had a motivation to remove the body. Right? The Roman guards who were supposed to be keeping the tomb secure, they would have no motivation to take Jesus' body, right? because they would get in trouble for not guarding it securely. The Jewish religious leaders certainly had no interest in stealing the body. They actively wanted to make sure that this Jesus movement ended and nothing would be more likely to keep it going than by having the tomb be empty. Right? And then, I just, as I just explained, the disciples would know that they were just putting themselves in danger by pulling a stunt like that. The disciples had a motivation for the resurrection to happen, right? Because they had followed Jesus. They would want the resurrection to happen, but they certainly didn't have a motivation to fake the resurrection. So, the disciples had nothing to gain. The Roman guards had nothing to gain. The Jewish religious leaders had nothing to gain. None of them had anything to gain by taking the body. No one else would have had anything to gain. It's not like there, were, there was gold in there or something like that. Who wants a corpse, right? And yet the tomb was empty. So why? Well, you know what I think. <laughs> but I just want to put that chain of reasoning out there for you. If you're skeptical this morning, something to think about, right? Something to, uh, to process. Anyway. So a lot more could be said about reasons to believe the resurrection, and I've done that before. You can go back and look at, listen to all five or six years of my sermons on Easter if you really want to, and you can hear me talk more about that stuff. But that's not really what I want to talk about this morning. Because the Gospels themselves show us that recognizing Jesus as risen isn't just about logical reasoning. Logical reasoning is valuable. It has its place. I don't think we're just supposed to turn off our brains. But there's more than logic going on when we recognize that Jesus is risen. When I read over the resurrection accounts this week, something I was struck by is that there are three times where Jesus, the risen Jesus is literally standing in front of somebody and they don't realize that it's him. But then something happens, and that makes the person realize, oh my, this is Jesus. He's risen. So I'm calling these moments realizations of resurrection. And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at these three moments and ask, how is Jesus' resurrection being revealed in these moments? And what can we learn from that? Okay? Okay. So, first realization of resurrection, Mary Magdalene, who I believe is the first one to see the risen Jesus. Let's look at John 20, starting in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. So she's already gone to the tomb. She's seen that it's empty. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And so she's crying about Jesus' body being gone. She looks up. She sees the risen Jesus standing there. But she doesn't realize that this is the person she's crying over. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
So Mary realizes that Jesus is risen, not when she sees the empty tomb, not when she sees Jesus, but when Jesus says her name. When she hears her name spoken, she realizes this person knows me, this is my rabbi, my Lord, my friend. Okay, so, number one, realization of resurrection. How does it come to Mary? In the speaking of a friend's name. Okay, we're going to talk about each one of these more later, but we're just going to go through the whole list. So that's the first one, in the speaking of a friend's name. Next story, the travelers to Emmaus. This is from the Gospel of Luke, starting in chapter uh, 24, verse 13. I love this story. Really weird, interesting story. Okay. Uh, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village in which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So such an interesting story. These travelers are referred to as two of them. Two of what? Well, I think it's clear from the context, that these are two of Jesus' followers. Remember, Jesus had more followers than just the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples were the ones that uh, he was closest to, but he had many other followers. And these two guys seem to be some of Jesus' followers. They're talking about Jesus. They know where the disciples are, right? It seems like they have no problem finding the the 11 disciples. So... That's, that's relevant because these two guys would have known what Jesus looked like. They would have heard Jesus' voice. Right? And yet, the risen Jesus is right in their presence. And it's not clicking with them that this is Jesus. Right? It doesn't click until Jesus takes bread, breaks it, and gives it to them. So, number two, how does the realization of resurrection come to these, these people? It comes in the breaking of bread. Again, we'll talk about this more in a moment. Finally, last story, number three. Thomas the disciple. This is from John 20, starting in verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Now this one is a little bit different than the last two because unlike the last two, Thomas actually admits before seeing Jesus, I will not believe even if I see Jesus. And he specifies what he would need in order to believe. He would need to see the scars from the crucifixion on Jesus' body. And lucky for him, he gets to see exactly that, right? And then he believes. So, number three, realization of the resurrection. How does it come to Thomas the disciple? In the showing of scars. The showing of Jesus' scars. So let's think about this list. In the speaking of a friend's name, in the breaking of bread, in the showing of scars. In each of these stories, these things happen, and it is like a switch gets flipped. And someone goes from unbelief to believing that Jesus is risen from the dead. In each of the stories, it's not a rational assessment of the facts. Um... You know, it's not even seeing Jesus that flips the switch. It is something else. And I think that the Holy Spirit is showing us through these stories something about the mystery of belief, how we come to believe. We're we're being shown three ways that people's eyes are open to the reality of the resurrection. And these are not necessarily the only ways, but I think we can learn from these. So first, the speaking of a friend's name. What I see here is this emphasis on personal connection with Jesus. Mary's eyes are open to the reality that Jesus is risen because she hears Jesus call her name. And, you know, what that means is we can analyze the historical data all we want, and that usually only gets us so far. You know, I remember when I was in campus ministry, I would talk to skeptical people students all the time and try to argue for the resurrection and I would use all these apologetic arguments that I thought were pretty persuasive and compelling and sometimes people would say oh yeah that is that's a good point that's a good point but it was like something just wouldn't click right there's something more that's needed so if you feel like you're struggling to believe don't just try to figure it out by reading about history and looking at philosophical arguments and that sort of thing. That stuff has its place. But I don't think that God has arranged things so that we come to know him by being smart enough or by being informed enough. That would be kind of a cruel way to set up the world, wouldn't it? But the way that you come to know God is just by having enough information or by being bright enough to put all the pieces together, right? The Bible tells us that God has set things up such that he is not far from any one of us so that we may reach out for him and find him. And one of the ways that we reach out for God, one of the ways that we hear him call our name, is through prayer. I mean, it sounds like such a simple thing, but it's so important. And I know it can be hard to pray if we don't believe already. But the truth is, it's hard to believe if we don't pray. So if you're on the fence, try it. Right? Don't, don't just think about God as an object. Try to start to interact with God as a personal subject. Seek God as a person. Talk to God and try to listen to God. And if you do that, you may suddenly find yourself with an assurance that Jesus is risen because you are communicating with the risen Jesus. Okay, So that's the first thing. Second, breaking of the bread. 
What this second story shows us is that Jesus wants to open people's eyes to the reality of the resurrection through what we call communion, or the Lord's Supper. And I know, you know, for some of us, especially those of us who are not in the church, or maybe like church is new to us, this point might seem kind of weird, kind of churchy, kind of, kind of traditional, but I really think that's what the point of the story is. Uh, If you've been coming here for a while, you know that every week we practice communion, Um, uh, what's what's also known as the Lord's Supper. At the Last Supper, before Jesus' arrest, he took some bread, he broke it, and he said, this is how I want you to remember me. I want you to receive bread as the symbol of my body, and I want you to receive uh, wine as the symbol of my blood offered for you. And this is a special act that I want you to do in remembrance of me until I return again. And in this story, right, uh, these, these two travelers, they don't recognize Jesus until he breaks the bread, just like at the Last Supper. And then suddenly it clicks for them that Jesus is risen. And that tells us that the resurrection is going to be revealed to people through this special act that Jesus has instituted. One of the ways that that Jesus is going to show people that he is alive is through this. Now, you might have wondered, why did Jesus suddenly disappear after he broke the bread? Isn't that really weird? Well, I think it's because Jesus was emphasizing, now, now that when my physical presence is gone, this is where I want you to look to find me is in this special act of taking in the bread and the wine. You know, you can imagine, like, he breaks the bread, and then he disappears, and the bread just, like, bang, falls on the table. This is where my presence is now, is in this special act. If you want to commune with me, come together with the fellowship of believers and receive the bread and the wine. So, If we want to believe in the resurrection, if we want help in believing that, we should make it a point to participate in this special act that Jesus instituted. And then finally, the showing of his scars. This is how Thomas comes to believe. And, you know, of course, the scars are evidence that the body that Jesus is in is the same body that was crucified, right? Or at least it's some transformed version of that body. But I think there's another layer of meaning here in Thomas discovering that Jesus is risen through the scars. Because the scars are the signs of his love, right? The scars are there because God so loved the world that he was willing to go through Good Friday, right? God wants to inspire our belief by reminding us of his sacrifice for our sins. A God who gives himself like that for us is worthy of our belief and our trust. So if we're struggling to believe in the resurrection at Easter, those three things are hints of how we might be able to grow in belief. Not logical arguments, right? There's something more mysterious here. But if you're struggling to believe, I encourage you to reflect on those three things. Personal connection, communion, and the signs of his love. Now, I want to finish with a challenge for those of us who do believe. We're not on the fence. We believe in the resurrection. Jesus said to his disciples... As the Father sent me, now I send you. That's what he told them after the resurrection. And so that means that if we are believers in the resurrection, spiritual descendants of the disciples, Jesus is also sending us. Since Jesus is no longer physically present on earth, we as the church are the body of Christ. We are supposed to be a sign to the world that Jesus has risen from the dead. That's a high calling, but that is the calling 
that Jesus has given the church. And I think that these three stories might help us to see how we as the church can help the world realize that Jesus is risen. Maybe the resurrection won't be real to some people until someone in the church calls them by name. Right? Somebody in the church shows a genuine interest in knowing them and knowing their story. Right? There are so many people out there who are hurting to just have someone actually care about them and call them by name. Right? When we as the church do that, we are reflecting the, the, the risen Jesus who called Mary by name. Maybe the resurrection won't be real to some people until they, are, they find themselves in a fellowship of believers and they are invited to participate in communion. Do we believe that there is power when the church gathers and celebrates in the way that Jesus told us to celebrate? Or are we too embarrassed to invite someone into that space? You know, maybe we need a little bit more confidence that if we give that invitation, if we break the bread and invite people to the table, that Jesus will show himself as risen through that. Okay? And then lastly, and this is the hardest one, maybe the resurrection won't be real to some people until the church shows a willingness to be scarred for the sake of the world. When the church is willing to suffer so that the love of Christ might be revealed, the reality of the resurrection becomes a lot harder to deny. When the church loves like Jesus loves. Lord, we thank you so much for these mysterious, strange stories that help us to maybe see belief in a new light. Lord, uh, we want to be able to believe in your resurrection fully and be transformed by it. And Lord, if that means that uh, we need to hear you calling our name, Lord, may we listen and hear you calling our name. If that means that we need to come to the table and receive your body and your blood, Lord, may we come to the table, may we receive that invitation, may we invite others into it. And Lord, if it, if it means that we need to pay attention to your scars, that we need to pay attention to the signs of your love for us, to the cross. Lord, help us to pay attention. Speak to us through these things. Lord, help us to realize that you are risen and help us to help the world realize that you are risen. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now is the point in our service where we continue our worship through celebrating the Lord's Supper, just as we talked about in the message. Um, we are still doing individual communion cups because of COVID. And uh, so the way that this works is we invite you to come up, lining up here. And uh, as you come forward, I will invite you to receive, and you can receive one of the cups um, by saying amen, or thanks be to God, or crossing yourself, or not saying anything, whatever you want to do. And uh, then you take the cup back to your seat, and whenever you feel ready to receive, uh, you can do so. And I, I like to say, you know, sometimes these cups are easy to get into, sometimes they're not. I pray that the today they are easy to get into. But I always like to say, just remember, even if the cup is inaccessible, God's grace is still accessible to you. We also invite you, as you come forward, to place in the basket underneath the communion table uh, your connection cards with your prayer requests uh, or any questions that you have about the church, any ways that you'd like to get involved. And we also encourage you to place any tithes or offerings in that basket as well. Please keep in mind that uh, we are an independent church completely supported uh, by your offerings. So I encourage you, as you come forward to receive today, um, to think of that moment when the risen Jesus broke the bread for those travelers and to imagine yourself at that table with them and to see it as a way of saying, I want to trust in the resurrection. I want to experience the power of the resurrection. I want to receive that. And to believe that this is the way, one of the ways that Jesus has instituted for us in order to deepen our, our belief and our trust. Um, here at St. Paul's, you are free to receive uh, as long as you have put your trust in Jesus. And uh, if today is the first day that you want to put your trust in Jesus, uh, you are still welcome to come forward and receive. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. So as you feel called and as you feel led, come and receive God's holy gifts for God's holy people.
Amen. Happy Easter, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Would you please rise on up for our mellow uh, yeah. leaving song? Away. My pain is healed in his name. I believe. 
soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame he's taken away. My pain is healed in his name. I believe. raise a banner my lord has conquered the grave of my redeemer my redeemer my redeemer my redeemer you left my burden I'll rise with you Turn top, see your kingdom come. My redeemer lives. 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 Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Right. Let's say our benediction. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended. Because our worship never ends. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.